The guidebooks will tell you half the population of England lives within an hour's drive from this place. But we are presently underneath the Peak National Park, the most visited park in Europe. You can't tell from down here, but with 22 million visitors every year, this park is busting at the seams. And yet unused and almost forgotten for 30 years, over 20 miles of preserved railway track bed and tunnels run the length of this park. With every year, it's more clear that this success in attracting visitors just can't be sustained. Not unless you're prepared to help protect the park from the millions who want to visit here. The railway is one solution. No wonder the locals are all steamed up. Amongst the people who live and work around the Peak Park, a vision is beginning to emerge of the possibility of a born-again railway, a line dedicated to transporting tens of thousands of those visitors. Back in 1974, when the Peak Rail Society was formed, our aim was to reopen this line all the way so that we could bring the tourists back into this valley and get them off all the roads. This is an exact replica of the Midland Railway's line through Millersdale as it was at the turn of the century, 1960 for precise, just after the Midland Railway had built the second viaduct and remodelled all the track work here. The reason I built this model was because in 1968, British Railways were going to close this line. And I thought at the time that it would be nice just to let people come and see what this railway originally looked like before it was closed. Of course, today now, we've got talk that the line might just reopen which, if it does happen, is, is good news to me. It took me and, and my mother and some other volunteers five years to build this. Even now, it's not finished. And this is a line that clearly should never have been closed. The pleasant market town of Bakewell is the only major population centre within the boundaries of the park. And even on early spring days, it's already busy. For its main street is the crowded A6 trunk road. It can't be widened, and the park laws will not permit a bypass. The locals are already looking elsewhere for a possible solution. Presently, the Peak Railway Company can't help Bakewell's traffic problems. It's not a local transport system yet. It's still only a preserved steam bus railway with a few miles of track running in the outskirts of the park. And it's stuck there. To get any further and break out from this confinement and forge a link with the track bed and tunnels inside the park, they couldn't do better 
then listen to the people at East Lanx Railway. For there, an old coal line has been used to break out of the valley that trapped their railway. But escape into the larger world wasn't easy for East Lanx. To make it possible, they had to build the steepest gradients to leapfrog the new Metrolink tram system. Next, they bridged the motorway to get the line to Rochdale. Now it's a case of steam trains back to steam trains in two generations. East Lanx always thought big. Yeah. Well, this is where the East Lancashire Railway started in 1972. And we came in here with just a steam roller, a small steam locomotive, a diesel locomotive, in fact, five pieces of rolling stock. We were trapped within the yards and the confines of this old building for over 16 years, planning to build an East Lancashire Railway, Nine Mile Railway. This used to be a BR badge, and well, now it's an East Lancashire Railway badge. Unfortunately, Dr. Beeching got rid of me, and now I drive trucks and trains on East Lancashire Railway. This is the local, our first steam local that we, we operated here, which is ex Burnley Gas Board. We used to run brake van rides up and down the, the, the shed yard with that one. It's a good little local and it's still running. Once free of the engine shed yard, the way was clear for the East Lanx people to drive a railway the full length of the Errol Valley, from Bury just north of Manchester to Rottenstall in the foothills of the Pennines. Of course, East Lanx Railway didn't do it alone, and help, when it did come, arrived from an unexpected quarter. There are five valleys in, in Greater Manchester. The Errol Valley is the, is the largest. Um, and, and many would say, including myself, it was the most polluted, um, presenting the biggest problem. And in, in that sense, it was a massive problem for planners to, to face and come up with solutions. We hope we found one, which is a success story. The local government solution was breathtakingly simple. Back a volunteer railway company and transform the old rail line through the valley. Well, these Lanks Railway is opposite of any other railway. Unlike the Keith Linworth Valley Railway and the North Yorkshire Moors Railway, these were railways that were built in regular tourist attractions. We had to build the dream. Once the industry came into decline in the valley, the dye works, the paper mills, the cotton mills all closed, nature took hold, and it's changed it back into what is a very pleasant area. It was the perfect reversal. If preserved railways traditionally run through great national parks or places of outstanding natural beauty, why not reverse the process and create a park around a preserved railway? The boost has come from the local authorities who've seen the potential of this. They've opened up footpaths by the river, picnic areas, and there's a partnership that we're working. The tourists can enjoy the railway and enjoy the natural countryside as it used to be. It was a double bonus for Chairman Trevor Jones. As a 13-year-old, he'd walk this very line, delivering his railwayman dad his lunch in a pudding bowl. So for him, that local partnership was a consummation devoutly to be wished. It pulled tourists and locals into areas of the valley that had literally been abandoned. More to the point, when it was up and running, it even paid for itself. The costs stacked in the favour of redeveloping the railway. It was quite clear that if you had to address all the liabilities and the problems of crossing and recrossing the airwell, the railway option, before it deteriorated to a point where you were talking about crazy figures, was worth arresting at that point and, and, and getting back in shape. And in that respect, as long as the volunteers operate the railway, the figures make sense. How are they can support guarantees an army of volunteers? From his office, he overlooks a successful railway. These are the offices of Berry Council Planning Department. For many years, I was the assistant director of town planning. On my retirement, I came down these stairs, I walked into Bolton Street Station here, and I signed on as a ticket collector. I was director of engineering at Berry for some years, and uh, for my sins, they subsequently made me responsible for the bridges, uh, tunnels and viaducts on this line between Berry and Rottenstall. So, what do I do when I retire? But volunteer to be a guard on the railway line. With evidence like that, you wouldn't need to be Oliver Stone to develop a conspiracy theory about links between Bury Planning Department and the East Lanks Railway. 
and quiet tales are told about plans for bridges being adjusted to accommodate the future needs of the Eastlands. It's not only the planning department that's been adept at helping. Everyone gets involved. Local enthusiasts recreated the old station at Bury and cobbled it together from bits and pieces from all over. Well, this is Bolton Street Station, and as you can probably see, it's a mixture of architectural styles. Now, over here, we've got um, a building which is rather unique. It dates from around 1954 and was built by British Rail. Here is, by contrast, a, a very old building, and it was actually built out of modular units from Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway signal boxes. So it's obviously part of the period. Now over here, there is a building which originally was part of the Berry Corporation tramway depot. And it was dismantled stone by stone and re-erected here on the station. Reason because the architectural style fits in with the type of building which would have stood here originally. It isn't a matter of just punching tickets, it's talking to people, which is something I do enjoy. I meet all sorts. The railway, I think, is run by retired people, unemployed, unemployable, eccentrics, a strange amalgam of people, perhaps of which I am one. This is the bedroom. It's a little bit small, but it does for me. And this is the lounge. Did all the work myself, and as you can see, I'm a bit of a railway freak. I joined the railway in uh, 1982, and uh, I became the railway painter. And I paint everything from signal posts, water towers, the railway station. Uh, in fact, anything that it doesn't move, I'll paint it. And I like being here. I mean, that's what made me home here. I really love it. You can't beat the East Lancs Railway. It really is the place to be. Dave Taylor asked permission to park his new home, named for his wife Margaret, on this railway siding. So intertwined is his life and this railway. Right, this was uh, just a tip. And I decided, over the years, to turn it into a decent garden. I was just fed up with the mess and the state of this place. So as you can see, I started over there and gradually worked my way down through the picnic area into the fish pond. And then, four and a half years ago, my wife passed away. And uh, I didn't want to bury her in a cemetery, so the railway agreed to be putting their ashes in the garden. And that's where they are to this day. I came to the railway in 1986 because I've always been a railway enthusiast and I wanted to do something um, involved in, in, a, in a railway. Gradually I became a guard. No one knew I was a priest. But as time went on, they found out. And I was asked on one occasion to bury the ashes of Margaret in the Garden of Remembrance. And then Roger, in his will, wanted his ashes scattered from a moving train onto the line. And they asked me to do that as well. And I was absolutely delighted. East Lanc specializes in finding comfortable round holes for square pegs. I am the carriage and wagon director on East Lancashire Railway. And in real life, in my private life, I sell Smarties and Kit Kat. This is a Great Western observation saloon. They used by directors of the Great Western Railway. It's been restored by Pete Waterman, who's, like ourselves, a railway enthusiast. And it's a great privilege to me, and one of the perks as chairman, to be able to use it. No, you talk to other planners and they will say that their key to success was different. Ours happened to be a railway. We had an active volunteer force who wanted to progress their own dreams. And a partnership was forged between the local authorities and the voluntary sectors and the communities. The railway brought prosperity to the valley in the 1850s. And in those days, the, the valley was known as the, Go the Golden Valley. Hopefully the railway, based on being a tourist attraction, has brought those golden days back again. For Brian Topping, whom Dr. Beeching's cuts reduced from a train driver to a truck driver, what has been lost in terms of the railways can't be forgiven. For him, 
It's become a private vendetta. You get all the government now whinging about them, simply on rail. What rail? What railway? The no railway into Rotten Store, apart from the preserve railway. Well, in BR days, there was a railway into Rotten Store. The passenger service into Rotten Store. There isn't now only us on the weekend. They same up and down the railway. They've closed it, it's gone. That long, dark winter of disillusionment for the railways and the supporters seems to be frozen in time and memory. This is the final irony. For reasons no one can fathom, all the preserved railways up and down the country are charged twice as much to move their steam engines on the mainline railway network than it costs to have them transported by road. So that's how visiting locomotives are moved, on the motorways, and not on the railways they were built for. A thousand visitors up here on Sundays. It gets quite busy. Uh, they come to look at the old station. Of course, it isn't the old station. It's a new one that we had to build. Um, we got all the suitcases out, the old-fashioned things. We're trying to work ourselves on the 50s, which I think we achieve. That takes them back to those times. <laughs> And 10 years ago, there was no station building at all. We had to start from scratch. It was just completely overgrown. Uh, weeds coming through the track. Just dial it. Volunteer station master Brian Armand is Ramsbottom's unofficial ambassador. He's had to learn to cope with a flood of dignitaries who have come up the line to witness for themselves the success of this railway and the new station. I'm concerned, the investment that the council has put into East Lands Railway is one of the best investments the council has made. One just has to look around the station this morning, it's heaving with people, there's families come for the day out, the shops in the town are booming, there's new businesses, new restaurants opening, what more could one ask from an investment? It's a trick of the preserved steam railway to take you through the time warp and back into a half-remembered past. Back to a more ordered Britain, when it seemed that railways were a fixed part of the scenery. There are little bits of that history preserved all along this line, and some of them might surprise your average steam buff. Bolton Street Tunnel was built in 1846 by the original East Lancashire Railway, and a few years afterwards they carved this coat of arms on the pillar here. And in the centre, you can see the carving of the Red Rose of Lancashire and surrounding it in the garter, the motto of the company, Celeritate et Utilitate, which roughly translates as with speed and with service, which is something of an irony because in 1851, the shareholders complained that out of 50 locomotives, only five were serviceable.
railways are so much a fixture of our lives, we even see the rail line when it's no longer there. Like an event waiting to happen, the old line through the Peak National Park is presently reduced to the status of a heritage trail. And it will take more than just track and engines to recreate this railway. The big start to do just that has already been made, but outside the confines of the park. Peak Rail has just completed the latest stage of its plan and extended its track to almost five miles, only to be stopped dead on the wrong side of the A6 road. Arthur Dudson designed this last stretch of the railway, and he's encyclopedic on the subject, but it's the site that appeals most to him. This site has been developed by Peak Rail. It is 23 acres in area, and therefore we have plenty of room to operate. We are not allowed to store rolling stock in the Peak National Park, which is just north of this site, and therefore it is the ideal place for us to establish as our main depot for locomotive and rolling stock maintenance. All that said, Arthur is only telling half the story. There is another hidden asset on this site, but it will take lots of real muscle to reveal itself to the casual onlooker. Trainee territorial sappers come free of charge in exchange for the chance to develop their skills as Peak Rail strives to locate and recapture a railway pass that lies hidden under this grove. Just give him a few minutes, Jim. Give plenty of room. This is no brutal rape of the landscape. The army are digging into the very recent past here. Under this new surface greenery, they expect to find a lost railway world. A complete system of service pits and ton tables and main supplies of a major rail complex once handled 50 locomotives a day. When I came back here with Peat Rail, most of the Peat Rail members didn't know this place existed. They've read about it in books, but since it was demolished, they couldn't find no record of it. There was virtually no traces left of it at all. It's Peat Rail's good fortune to have uncovered a working railway depot, providing the perfect launch pad to bridge the main roads and link up once more with the tunnels and track bed in the park. Oh, we're doing a nice archaeological dig with the help of the Territorial Army. Oh, eventually it will all come back to life. As you can see, blue brick floors are all pretty well intact, so it will recreate some of the past. I am the only original BR member of staff of Pete Rail. Quite a lot of my old friends come down and see me, have a see how I'm going on and say, by God, Dick, you're bringing some memories back for me. For years, the steam buffs were trapped in the past, salvaging old steam engines and restoring them. And the matter might have stopped there if the Disneyland of Heritage Britain hadn't begun to make commercial sense. This is more than just a club for people who like to get their hands dirty. For these men often work to higher tolerances than the old British Rail handbook requires. The surprise is that jobs men hated to do for a living, they'll happily do for a hobby. In normal life, I'm a lawyer. This is my hobby. I relax at weekend by building railways. I've been working for this railway for over 15 years now, and we've been working on this site here for nearly 10 years. I remember it from the first day on site when the site was covered in trees and grass and you could hardly tell there'd ever been a railway here before. All there was was a few derelict buildings. Everything that's here, we brought in. We've been through about 25,000 tonnes of material over that time. Uh, the signal box, incidentally, isn't original. That is brought in as well, came in in two pieces on the low loader. Down here, it's railways, right or wrong. Steam, first and foremost. If there's a surprise, it's that local politicians now show an interest in their passion. A passion that they know from friends and family 
normally marks them off as eccentric or even daft. I'm in no way a, a steam buff. I'm a local community politician. Uh, when Pete Rail came along and suggested the idea of reopening the railway along this valley, most people were pretty cynical. I think they've been largely won over. It's a funny alliance of local politicians, railway buffs, and in a funny way, it's like uh, it's a back to the future dream to reopen the steam railway through this valley. Back to the future is correct. I'm 16 years of age and I've been involved with Pete Rail since I was 13. And thus I never had the chance to appreciate the nostalgia of steam on British railways. Of course, some of my older colleagues on the railway are here because they can remember that and they want to recreate that. But I think there must be something magical about steam because we're attracting a younger generation to the railway. And without it, I don't think there would be preserved railways at all. There's no doubting the magic of steam, but these days it comes at a price. And if a stretch of railway is to be preserved, a business plan and a marketing strategy comes with it. Obviously, nostalgia is the big word, because that's what a lot brings a lot of people in to railway preservation. They're looking back on the past, they're trying to preserve something that has gone from the mainstream of life. But having said that, what we have to remember is nostalgia alone doesn't pay the bills. We are a business. Steam enthusiasts only form a very small part of our visitors. The majority of visitors to a preserved steam railway are, in fact, families. And then, of course, there's the other aspect, as far as we're concerned, of putting back a service for the community. And this is where we have got to cooperate and talk to the local politicians. Bakewell Station, 1910. Bakewell Station, 1996. As the environmental officer, for Derbyshire Downs District Council. It's my responsibility to look at sustainable ways of getting people around sustainable development. We've got the track in place, the buildings are here, all we need is the trains. The most surprising people give reasons why we should preserve steam railways. It'll take half a million just to build one bridge to carry the locomotives across the A6 and into the park. To raise that kind of money, the politicians will have to distance themselves from the steam buffs and talk about congestion and local jobs and community. This is the Peak Park. It's uh, the most visited of any in the world, apart from Mount Fuji in Japan. It gets 22 million visitors. Uh, the reason for that is we're surrounded by half the population of England within uh, travelling distance. Big cities like Manchester and Birmingham, Nottingham, Liverpool. And the problem is that most of the people who come here come in their cars. The rule seems to be that cars are bad and trains are good. We can take people through an area of outstanding natural beauty. Effectively, efficiently, we can get the congestion off the roads. It's a sustainable way to get people around. And even if I wasn't a green person, I would still say this is the way to get around. It's a human way to get around, it's a comfortable way around, and it's social. Martin Doughty is the leader of Derbyshire District Council and one of their eight representatives in the Peak National Park Authority. He also chairs that authority. We want to work closely with the steam buffs, but what I think that they must accept is they're never going to build this railway alone and it's never going to be, if it gets built, just a steam railway. It needs to be a railway that will carry passengers on a regular basis into the park, indeed through the park, and also carrying stone from the quarries. Limestone to clean the sulphur from the stacks of nearby power stations is the latest argument to be marshalled. Originally we envisaged that it would just be tourists and the local people perhaps would want to use the railway line. But now it also makes commercial sense because since those far off days, 1974 when Peak Railway Society was formed, uh, we've got much more conscious about the environment. At the present moment in time now, the quarries just, just the north of us over that hillside over there 
they're having to ship out nearly a thousand tons of limestone a month by road to the power stations in the Trent Valley. The steam buffs are secretly happy for politicians to promote new arguments for a modest return to steam in the present day. They know that's their only chance to finance the way forward. And to all the polished new arguments, the steam buffs add their own special ingredients, the one that sustained them down all the long years, their simple, clearly focused passion for steam engines. I like the black flag because they're a workhorse. The economic locomotive, they loot well, they pull well, they ride well. In fact, they're a good general purpose locomotive. I can show you loads. You look at it from a driver's point of view now, right? Everything is easy to reach. All the oiling points are dead easy. Your lubricators, your axle boxes and cylinders, dead easy to reach. Sand boxes, they're a bit difficult, maybe, but the general layout of the locomotive is fantastic. You know, it's got a tipper boiler, which is best for steam. It's a good rider, it's got good driving wheels and good brakes. From this driver's point of view, the Black Five is truly special, an engine without blemish. I'm definitely biased to, to middle and regional locomotives. Great Western are all right, but too complicated. It's his enduring love affair. Even the big special guest locals don't seriously tempt him. The guest ones are oh, a girl like the Duchess. Again, designed by Sir William Stanier. I like the Duke, that's OK, but, you know, I do like the Duchess. These big fancy locomotives, they're all right, but you usually hell of a coal. No, that's gospel truth. They're too big for a line like this. It's like giving Lester Figure at Desert Organ saying walk around that lawn. It is. You know, they're a good crowd puller. I'll give you that. But as a general purpose, you can't beat a local like this. This, the best. The best. Take it home tonight if I could. Put it in our drive tonight if I could. No fear about it. They're the finest. Look at the line. Look at, look at the look of it. Look at the line of it. Perfect. Perfect. Nothing sticking out of these fucking around here, there and everywhere. I'm sorry, I get, I get one up about locomotives. <laughs> Okay, I want pastrami on Bavarian rice, sweet pickle, tomato. Easy on the Dijon, kosher dill and salt. Excuse me, double decaf hazelnut latte, medium roasted Colombian beans, 2%. Sirloin, hoagie, coffee, jack cheese, lettuce, tomatoes, capers, and Russian dressing. Fresh parmesan and oregano to go. The new Chrysler Neon, built for the most demanding country in the world. This Saturday, only in the Daily Telegraph, is a special travel magazine and part one of our Good Holiday Guide. Throughout January, you'll be up to 50% off selected Page and Moy holidays, over a thousand trips to be won, and 50% off Air UK flights. Follow our travel advice to the letter, and we'll help you escape. Only in Britain's biggest selling quality daily, the Daily Telegraph, for the A to Z of travel. Ask any steam train expert, and they'll tell you that if there was a league table for the most stunningly picturesque preserved railway on earth, then the Fastiniog Railway in Wales would be near the top of everyone's list. Maybe it's the two-thirds build scale, the same toy town proportions they used in Disneyland. One thing is for sure, this is a railway that understands the charm of this. In his capacity as editor of the Railway Buff magazine, Railway World, Handel Cardus is about to embark on the classic Fastiniog journey. 
It's a journey that will carry him up and through the very best of the stunning Welsh mountains. For him, this is a serious working railway, and Cardiff doesn't like people who make toy town jibes about the Festiniog. I would not call it a toy railway. The Festiniog thinks bigger, it's heavily engineered, it was built with a real purpose, and one of its main purposes was the transport of slate. It was doing a real job, and in its day, it was more profitable than the London North Western Railway, which was the biggest company in the world. When viewed in the light of the spring sunshine, it seems an almost unbelievable claim. But this railway didn't make fortunes or find success down here among the sheep and the hill farms. The money that made the Festiniog lay higher up the mountain, right at the top, where the great slate mines used the railway to ferry cut slate to the port and then shipped it on to roof half of continental Europe. All on its own, this little railway literally ate up half a Welsh mountain and carried it off to the coast. These days, the great slate mines of Blaine of Festiniog, with the fabled galleries and mist-shrouded peaks, are as much a working museum as a serious place of work. And in that new capacity, it has helped to save the little railway that Slate created. But there is more to the Vestiniog than ferrying tourists. It has long been established as a seven days a week railway, running scheduled services for the public, a real working railway in addition to its preserved status. I started volunteering here when I was at uh, university studying engineering. I've always been interested in railways, but I came here in my engineering vacations because this is a good place to learn practical engineering yeah. because there's all, we do all types of engineering work here. Is there anyone that sticks out that much? No, that, that'll, that'll be all right. I mean, it's definitely not, the threads are definitely engaged. I'm one of the few uh, paid staff here on the Festinial Railway. And my job is engineer. All right then, Joe. We use a two-foot gauge here. That means basically there's two feet between the rails. And the Festinog Railway was uh, a very early uh, pioneer of using a narrow gauge. And what it meant really is you could build a railway much more cheaply than a normal standard gauge railway. And this idea of building a, a lower cost railway spread all around the world. Um, a lot of it inspired by the Festinog Railway. The railway's home base is Porth Madog on the North Wales coast. It was to hear in the old days that the slate was brought for shipping on. It's a sleepy enough place nowadays, but it can still manage one big surprise. For the Festiniog is not the only preserved railway based in this little tourist town. Just half a mile away, there exists a competitor, the Welsh Highland 1964 Railway Company Limited, and its main aim in life is plainly stated in its name. For over 30 years, the hope here has been to recreate the old Welsh Highland Railway that once ran the 25 miles to Carnarfon. Everything about this railway, in tone and style and ambition, seems diametrically opposed to the dreams and drives of the Festiniog. This locomotive we call Gallet. It was actually obtained from South Africa when we were visiting Johannesburg back in 1979. We discovered it at the Rustenburg Platinum Mines, and it's now been restored to full working order. This locomotive is from German South West Africa, and is, in fact, the biggest narrow-gauge steam locomotive in the country, we believe. And there's a major restoration job on here to get this working. Well, this has taken four years to restore. Uh, it's reputed that Gladstone rode in this coach. This is how it's finished its life as a summer house in a garden. It's still got its original fittings, like door handles, and a lot of it was used for patterns. This is the sole surviving locomotive from the original Welsh Highland Railway, built in 1906, and this is the flagship of the fleet. Sir Russell was lying at Dinnis when the railway closed, and the Minister of Supply took her on, took her over, and she went working in an um, iron ore quarry. That's how she survived. She's what, she's 90 year old this year. And my ambition is to see it pounding up through the Aberglassland Pass with this behind it. This is the Aberglassland Pass. 
But pursuing the dream of Russell steaming up here has caused a storm, for there is a David and Goliath situation brewing in this corner of Welsh Wales. Beside me is the track bed of the old Welsh Highland Railway, where a train last ran 60 years ago. And for the last five years, we've had two different railway companies fighting it out expensively in the courts for the right to reopen and operate this railway that went bankrupt four times in the first half of this century. David is the Welsh Highland 1964 company, Goliath the Festinio. And for a time, David appeared to be winning. First a high court test case, next a public inquiry. Then, on his last day in office, the transport minister reversed the situation and gave the new Welsh Highland to the Festinio, and all hell broke loose. It has got very bitter. There have been voiced threats. It's not surprising some of the Welsh Highland people going round in T-shirts at meetings with deft to the Festinio scum written on them. Yeah. All we've had so far from the other side of town is threats and aggression. Um, they ex keep expecting us to sort of hand over everything effectively. They expect us to give all the time where they keep forgetting that they're actually aggressors. So people, yeah, do get upset. Certainly there was a campaign of T-shirts at an EGM 18 months ago uh, where about sort of 15 members who were uh, very, uh, fairly um, upset um, printed some T-shirts up and uh, gave the FR chairman a, a bit of a hard time. The Festiniog chairman checks progress and the restoration of a big local that figures prominently in his plans for the new Welsh Highland. He doesn't buy the proprietorial stance his near neighbours take to this line. Many people have looked at uh, preserving the Welsh Highland Railway. We, in fact, looked at it in the early 1950s. Since then, many groups have looked at rebuilding the line, and one of those has been the Welsh Highland 1964 company. In 1994, the result of the public inquiry came out. The inspector said the 1964 company, in conjunction with the Gwynedd County Council, should have the track bed. The trouble is you, you end up with a difference between a big business orientated railway, which has said itself it is commercial, not a preserved railway, and you've got our own organisation where you've got the individuals who've been working here, some people have been here 25, 30 years, focused on this railway, and you get opposition coming in telling us hey, that our railway's no good for a start, we couldn't run a, in a brewery. First in the Og, we believe, is a very commercial organisation, but at the same time, it provides satisfaction to many, many thousands of volunteer supporters. Perhaps our friend at the 64 company would have preferred a different route with a, a slower railway with less pressures. Well, my preference is, um, is the Welsh Island. It's uh, very much more a small family sort of railway. Um, people who come and work here are all sort of uh, very good friends. Um, it's very much more of a social element rather than run as a business. We are often known as the train bath, the small train. The locals look at us as a community-based railway. People like me live in this area. Quite a few of our directors live in this area. I don't know what the other side are like. The other side are the one and only winners in the biggest game in town. Almost £6 million of Millennium funding has been granted for them to pursue their plans for the new Welsh Highland. In the process, the Festinio have gazumped the best hopes of their near neighbours. It's, um, well, it's very unfortunate, it's very annoying. A lot of people have worked very hard here over the years to actually build up what what we've got here. Um, um, it's, it's just unfortunate that sort of uh, politicians have got involved in what is essentially, for most people, a hobby. The first part of our project is costing just under £10 million. That's to rebuild the railway from Carnarvon to the foot of Snowdon for the year 2000. I think there is a fundamental difference between the ideal of the 1964 company and the ideal of the Festinio. The 1964 company, if you like, their aim has been to recreate a fairly cute railway. Whereas the Festinio fought big, they fought grand, they thought expansionist, they thought 25 miles. And I think it is this, if you like, this culture clash which is behind a lot of the problems. I also think it is that difference, which is why the Festiniog, though they lost the battles, at the end they won the war. Well, here we've got one of the monuments to the tragedy of the Welsh Highlands history, if you like. The first scheme to build the railway through 
This is one of their remains. They built the bridge. They built the embankment leading up to it. And when they got this far, is where the money ran out. And they stopped, and it was left. And this bridge is a bridge that never actually carried a train. The Welsh Highland Railway closed back in the 1930s. We have set out to rebuild the railway 25 miles long and complete that within the next 10 years. That is a task that nobody else has ever contemplated in this country before. Carnarvon hasn't had a railway for 30 years and its tourist market has tended to decline. The town are keen to see the railway arrive as soon as possible. I don't blame the volunteers at the FR or even the paid staff. I know many of them are just fed up about the situation as, uh, as we are. But unfortunately, it would appear that some people in the side of town have got big ideas, and unfortunately, it means crushing any opposition and getting in the way. We all work for nothing. I'm a volunteer. There are many thousands of other supporters who are volunteers on Festiniog and Welsh Highland, and, of course, the other railways in the country. We are so emotionally involved, we sometimes have disagreements. There's been a lot of talk about us buying a mile of track and it's a spoiling action. Well, that's not the case at all. We've said that we would build this railway and two miles of track from here and hand it over to the Festiniog Railway, lock, stock and barrel, when they affect a physical connection from the main line. So this is a very constructive position to take and leave us in more resources into the overall Welsh Highland scheme. I sometimes feel that if all the energy that had gone into our slanging had been put into building a railway, perhaps we would be, be, we would be talking at Cardiff now rather than Carnarvon. Every few weeks, both sides announce a new peace initiative. But only time will tell if they can manage to keep it on the rails. The steam locomotive is the attraction that will encourage tourists out of their cars onto the trains. The steam locomotive that should have died with Dr. Beeching is alive and well the length and breadth of the country. At any given time, more than a hundred locomotives are being restored and prepared for a new working life on the old steam lines. And every last one of them will soon be all steamed up and ready to roll. I think the interesting thing is that playing at trains question has been put, put at our door a few times now. I think no longer that statement frightens. We're quite happy to be accused of playing trains because that's been a success and we can prove it. <laughs> 